Hi friends, my name is Oliver Sharp and this is Fresh Perspectives from Amp Recover. Very excited to be joined today by Stephanie Davis, Senior Equity Research Analyst at SVB Larynx. Stephanie, how are you today? I'm great, Oliver. Thank you so much for having me on the program. To start, can you tell us about SVB Larynx and your position and role there at the organization? So I head up the healthcare technology practice over here at SVB Learink. And uh, for a bit of background, Learink was originally a healthcare investment bank. It was recently acquired by Silicon Valley Bank. So now I moved into the seat because it has 75% of all financings for health tech companies in the space. So it felt like an opportunity I couldn't miss out. Well, that sounds amazing. And I'm sure you've been busy for the last few months. I uh, would actually like to step back and hear about what broader trends you are seeing in the healthcare technology space uh, in 2019. And as we were moving into 2020, so pre-COVID, what were some of the broader trends at play? So as you, you looked in the past few years, you've seen a lot of innovation, less so on the hospital facing space and more on the payer and the uh, employer facing space. So you've seen a lot of innovations happen with employers or payers trying to reduce costs and they often tend to be a little bit more forward looking in their investments. So you saw all sorts of investments around diabetes care, virtual care, um, you saw a lot with fertility management and so most of the innovation there, but primarily in a virtual perspective. Uh, so how are those broader trends that you were seeing, how have they changed or accelerated over the last six months in response to COVID-19? Well, look at how we're doing this interview, right? <laughs> it's all moved virtually. I think if I, I used to always be a believer that virtual care would eventually happen, but it would be on maybe a 10 year, 20 year arc. All of that has sped up to today. So we've seen the same sort of directional moves, but a massive acceleration who would adopt it. Part of that was a, a lot of regu regulation around how healthcare could be delivered. Uh, a lot of those regulations were loosened in the last six months to allow things like this, televisits, virtual care delivery. Is that something in your opinion that's going to stick? Uh, or is it possible to kind of put the cat back in the bag and go back to those old regulations that we had pre-pandemic? So I think it's both a question of consumer preference as well as a question of regulation. Even before all regulation had moved in the direction of virtual care, you were seeing a lot of consumer facing solutions become much bigger. Um, out of pocket pay for behavioral health became much bigger for virtual solutions as it adds this convenience aspect. Same thing, you've seen a lot of players like Hey Doctor come out that were entirely a consumer payment solution, but there was always the demand that was starting to grow. If you think about convenience and how you access things like banking, for example. It's much more uh, when I want it, how I want it, sort of modality that it used to be in prior years. Healthcare is no different. Now on the regulatory side, you don't often see broader moves by the, the provider facing side unless regulation changes and they can very candidly get paid. So regulation changed, you had a little bit more reimbursement parity, you had the ability to get paid for these appointments, and that was what really drove um, a lot of the demand and a lot of the change in demand in the near term. It's been kind of an awakening. People's eyes are open now to say, you know, there was some fear around this. I think we're seeing a response that, hey, this works, people like it, uh, on both the provider and the patient side. Is that something that you're seeing? Completely. I think it's... It's one of those products that's much more convenient, but for years the pushback would always be, well, what if my doctor needs my blood pressure or my vitals, or he wants to listen to my lungs? That's not really an option. So there's a, a lot of concern around that, but it's pretty hard to argue with convenience, right? I took a good example that took my dad a month to figure out how to use the Uber app. Now he can't live without it. It's just the ability to have access when you want it and how you want it is such a game changer. It's a game changer for sure. And people are starting to take notice, uh, specifically some of the major technology players, the Googles, the Amazons, the Apples, uh, they're all entering the healthcare space. What does that mean for the sector? Is that a good thing uh, for companies that are already operating here? Is this type of competition uh, going to be healthy and how might this change the sector? I think it often creates a, a co-opetition environment, right? If you look at how the, the Googles and the Amazons and the Apples have entered the healthcare space, they've all taken it from their very much their own perspectives, right? Apple's entering it because they want to find a way to move iPhones and iPads. So you've seen a lot more eye devices inside the hospital system. Amazon has been entering more from an AWS perspective and they've been partnering 
partnering a lot with the big healthcare tech companies. Cern is a good example. Um, they're an AWS partner. So that's been allowing them to kind of sneak in and have a trusted brand there. Google has actually had um, some of the more major struggles because they tried to enter the space more directly into the hospital facing side. And even though they have data siloing, they have everything that you need for privacy, there's that ick factor of, well, what is Google going to do with my data? I'm not sure about this. So what we often don't mention when we talk about big tech players is Microsoft, and they have done extremely well in the space. And when I talk to hospitals, why they chose Microsoft, they just say, look, I know how they get paid, right? At the same time, any of these players could eventually be an acquirer for some of the more innovative health tech companies. I think it's a great way in order to get that trusted brand within healthcare, but also grow with a much larger base of uh, an Amazon or a Google or an Apple backing you. And that's why you're seeing some of the investments recently in my space. They certainly have the name recognition uh, for sure. And you mentioned investments in the space, uh, also some consolidation in the space. Uh, one huge one that I know you've been following uh, closely in the last few weeks, uh, Teladoc and Livongo. Let's talk about that. It's been a very busy summer. <laughs> um, Teladoc and Livongo getting together makes the a consolidated player within virtual care, which makes a lot of sense strategically. And I think it also shows that we're, we're kind of further along the curve than many folks thought for the virtual care world. It's interesting as it creates our own behemoth homegrown within health IT as opposed to the assumption that eventually one of the larger tech players would eventually do this. And um, it creates greater interest, which I think is why you've seen Google make an investment in American Mall. The space is certainly uh, heating up and hopefully that's to the benefit of all of us uh, as the patient population and in our health. So Stephanie, thank you so much for your insights. Really appreciated getting to talk to you today. Appreciate it.